Yes, man believes so out of the habit of thinking from the animal nature. But he must ask himself the question, who exactly is thinking in him and what is consciousness? The brain is an exceptional in the complexity of its structure and functions, including defense, bio device that has an astronomical number of elements and connections between them and does not have a direct contact with the environment. The brain is overabundant, in other words, it is capable of performing immeasurably more complex functions than is necessary, for example, to live on planet Earth. The brain is constantly at work, both night and day. It only changes its states, for example, to sleep, wakefulness, and so forth. It has an inherent constant self-reorganization of its system. It usually remains stable for to 2.5 seconds, then some variable and flexible links activate, others get turned off, while the hard links are constantly working. The brain is kind of bored from the monotony. There is an ongoing thought process. Processing of different information in it takes place round the clock. The brain is a mediator between consciousness and the world. It receives and tries to decipher codes, in other words, various signals, including those coming from the five senses. But it is especially important to note that the brain is capable of receiving many other signals not only from the visible but also from the invisible world. What serves as proof of this for the present-day scholars are the experiments conducted with the participation of people who engage in certain meditative practices while altering their state of consciousness. These are Buddhist monks, the Siberian shamans, the clairvoyants, and so on. Besides, this experimental group includes people who have manifested unusual abilities sporadically and spontaneously, which include telepathy, thought transfer, prediction of the future, telekinesis, the ability to move physical objects and change their shape by thought, and so on. In general, these abilities are inherent in any person, if developed. Anastasia, this is, in fact, evidence that a person in possession of basic knowledge is capable of successfully exploring the world in an altered state of consciousness without leaving his room, with his eyes closed, and without the help of technical resources or known sensory organs. Rigdon, note that such knowledge will be much more informative and richer than that obtained by a person in the usual state of consciousness. Why? Because his consciousness begins to work in a different mode. You can trace how brain activity reorganizes itself in an altered state of consciousness even with modern equipment. When human thinks in the ordinary state of consciousness, the activity of the nerve cells in different areas of the brain appears similar to a starry sky, in other words, scattered. But when a person is in an altered state of consciousness, then an entirely different picture of brain activity forms. The stars sort of line up in the form of peculiar star clusters of a particular form spheres, clouds, streams, and beams with a clear direction. In addition, attention should be paid to the structure, shape, of the human skull from the inside and the tissues adjacent to it. The frontal, parietal, and occipital bones, with their special relief, deserve special attention. This is sort of a biological prototype of concave mirrors that can focus, absorb, and reflect waves of different frequencies. This design serves as a good resonator, from the Latin word resno, I sound in response, respond, in other words, it is capable of accumulating and focusing the energy of vibrations and strengthening it. Anastasia, this information is quite interesting. As we know from the example of modern radio engineering, concave mirrors have the properties of receiving and transmitting antennas. Written, quite right. So the brain is, to a large extent, a unique biological device that performs many functions and serves as a receiver and transmitter of information not only from the outside visible but also from the invisible world, including man's inner world. When a person starts meditating, it gives a mental order engaging these or those chakrans and activating subtle energies which activate certain areas in the energy structure. Thanks to such mental order, the brain of the physical body, too, reconfigures itself into the operating mode of an altered state of consciousness. We can say that quite an interesting process takes place in deeper meditations, 
the meditator practically executes stopping of thoughts. And the information in its pure form is obtained due to the force which people since the ancient times called the sixth sense or intuition, intuitive knowledge. And learning in this way is much deeper, richer, and more varied than the usual apparent perception of the visible world. After all, the observer from the spiritual nature perceives the energy processes with feelings, wholly and clearly, experiencing the true reality. Thanks to this, it becomes obvious for him after meditation what a significant difference there is between what the human brain perceives as the reality from patterns in a three-dimensional world and what in fact reality which shapes the events of this world is. For such an observer, it is not a problem to extract information that is way ahead of the current scientific understanding of certain processes in this world. So the outside world for the brain as a bio-device is just multiple copies, which it perceives according to the task assigned to it by the observer in accordance with the inner world and the choice of the observer. Each person lives his reality according to his choice and inner perception. Anastasia, yes, now I have an even deeper understanding of why we should strive to live and gain first-hand experience with the perspective of the observer from the spiritual nature. Only then is there a real chance not to waste your life on numerous misconceptions, not to get stuck in the illusions of observations from the animal nature, to change your destiny, and shape the reality of your spiritual salvation even during this life. After all, what we think about is what will be created, manifesting one or another reality for us. Written, in his cognition, man can go as far as he believes he can. The more persistent he is to move away from his limiting mindsets formed by the animal nature, the more apparent his influence on the reality will be. Having formed in life a strong perspective of the observer from the spiritual nature, a person can understand his deep interconnection and interaction with the whole world. Human, as the observer from the animal nature, registers the objects that are important for him in the surrounding world, reinforcing their importance for himself by the power of his attention. Giving importance to this or that object depends on the outlook of a person, his experience in cognition of the world and himself. Once a person begins to rely on external circumstances, he begets motion which makes him anxious and manifests multiple illusions that grasp his attention even more. Human, as the observer from the spiritual nature, looks impartially at the world. His support in life and the significant object is the soul. After all, it is impossible to know the truth of the external without knowing the truth of the inner because then there is no observer before which all the secrets of the world are open. Anastasia, you know, there was a point in my life when I perceived many of your words more intuitively than consciously, they were inspiring and helped me to live and overcome human difficulties. But when advanced practices started, especially those related to the invisible structure of a human, this greatly expanded the limits of my perception of the world and contributed to the acquisition of an extraordinary spiritual experience, it provided an opportunity for the spiritual contemplation and self-discovery in the deepest feelings. Thanks to this experience, I realized the value of the knowledge that you are giving us. Indeed, experiences in meditation cannot be put into words but they fundamentally change the attitude to the surrounding world when you really feel something more valuable than the whole material world. The most interesting part is that since this practical breakthrough, the quality of meditations has changed. Especially, I would like to note the versatility of the, the lotus flower meditation in relation to the work with the deepest feelings and the wonderful practical basic knowledge about yourself that enables one to know the energy structure of man in the meditation pyramid. By the way, is it possible to tell the world about this meditation? And if so, I would be very grateful to you if people could learn about this primordial knowledge directly from you. Written, of course. The pyramid is far from the limit of perfection, although it is a very effective meditation that helps you to feel your true inner self and also to understand humans' complex structure that is little known to the present-day people. However, before speaking about this meditation, I think it is worth familiarizing people more with the knowledge concerning the invisible structure of man. Since ancient times, different peoples have possessed this knowledge. I cannot say that it is completely lost nowadays, some mentions of it have partially remained, 
but in what form is another question. But there is no reason to be surprised, man's sophisticated mind is capable of much more. As I have already said, the human is something far greater than just matter. In his structure, he is very complex, not only on the physical level but also on the level of energy. Observing humans physical structure, even with modern equipment, we can see only a part of its construction which exists in three dimensions. Moreover, if we consider the overall structure of a human, the majority of whose construction relates to the invisible world, we can find that at the physical level it has a much weaker protection than at the level of subtle energies. The overall structure of human is designed in such a way so that the soul is protected better than the body. The body is just an additional removable material shell created for certain conditions of existence in the universe in the geometry of the three-dimensional space. It is temporary and mortal. It is a kind of a bio-machine controlled by the personality, in other words, by the one who is constantly making choices reflected in the events of his life as well as his spiritual development in general. Changing bodies during the reincarnation is like a renewal of this additional outer shell, figuratively speaking, it is like regeneration of the skin in the physical body or a change of clothes in everyday life. Naturally, an interaction occurs between the energy and physical parts of human construction, different processes of exchange of energy and information. As I have previously said, everything in the world is interconnected. The world is multidimensional and has different parallels. Human in the invisible world is an informationally complex space-oriented entity that exists consistently in six dimensions simultaneously. It is difficult for a modern person to understand, but I hope that with the development of qualitatively new physics and biophysics, science will discover this fact as well. Human steadily and simultaneously exists in six dimensions that constantly influence each other. But a human has a chance during his life to unite his personality with the soul, to gain spiritual maturity and escape into the seventh dimension, nirvana, heaven, i.e. to achieve spiritual liberation and even to know higher dimensions if he wishes to. For comparison, a bodhisattva as a spiritual being existing freely during the earthly incarnation in a human structure of the body, as a spiritual being, bodhisattva can go to the spiritual world at any time, unlike the human soul that is enslaved in the construction, steadily exists in 72 dimensions simultaneously. This is the exact number of dimensions in the global universe. In short, a bodhisattva temporarily exists in a construction that is located in the six dimensions of the material world just like every human. But instead of the human soul, he has a perfect spiritual being from the world of God which steadily and simultaneously exists in 72 dimensions and can make changes in them. Anastasia, yes, that is a good example that gives an understanding what unique opportunities a human has for spiritual development in the course of his life and why each moment of life is so valuable. You've mentioned that the universe has 72 dimensions. I think readers will be very interested to know that the number of dimensions in the universe is limited. I remember you explaining before about the Azoismus, parallel worlds, the parallel paradox, about the difference between the concepts of parallel dimensions and parallel worlds. Written, yes, parallel worlds and dimensions are not the same things. There can be a multitude of parallel worlds. One way or another, they are intertwined with different dimensions. But all this exists in one global universe. What is a parallel? I shall explain with a figurative example from people's lives. Each person lives his life as if in his own everyday reality, in his microcosm, which for some moments intersects with some other realities in other people's lives. In other words, his individual consciousness lives separately, as if on its own parallel, but in a world that is common for everyone. Other people, with their lives, thoughts, the inner world, and the external environment, live parallel to him and he is not even aware of their existence. Same with parallel worlds, they are many, some come in contact with one another, others exist in parallel, remaining individual. But all of them are included in the system of 72 dimensions of the global universe. 
These 72 dimensions are generally represented by subtle and crude energies which constitute certain energy fields, forming a particular dimension. There are no clear boundaries between them. The same energies may be present in one dimension, and in another, and in a third one. All the dimensions are interconnected and separate at the same time. The difference is, we might say, in the energy architecture of each dimension. In the dimensions dominated by the more subtle energies, even the smallest change can produce global changes in other dimensions which are dominated by gross energies, consisting of subtle energies. The 71st dimension is one of the most complex in the energy structure. And the 72nd dimension is the most sophisticated, the highest, and the most universal dimension of the universe. From it, you can affect any dimension or parallel and produce any changes there, in other words, influence the azoismus directly. It is the highest dimension that an individual spiritual mind can comprehend thanks to its development in this universe world manifested through divine sound. Although the 72nd dimension is the most complex, it is quite simple at the same time. It is connected with the first dimension. The first dimension is, in essence, the primary impetus, Isoismus that carries all subsequent changes to other dimensions and affects all matter, including time, space, gravity, and so on. Without the Isoismus, there wouldn't have been any movement and therefore there would not have been life. This knowledge has existed since ancient times, although, in those associative forms that were understandable to the people living then. For example, in ancient India, China, and Egypt, the knowledge about the geometry of space and about the structure of the universe existed since ancient times. The sacred symbol of the 72 dimensions was a snake biting its own tail. Moreover, its body was depicted in the form of 72 rings, or rather links of the body, which symbolically implied dimensions of the universe. The snake's head symbolized the complex energy architectonic of the 71st dimension transitioning into the 72nd dimension. The snake's bite of its own tail symbolized the transition of the complex into simple and the connection of the 72nd dimension with the first dimension. Anastasia, yes, I have repeatedly encountered this ancient artifact in archaeological works dedicated to the culture and life of different peoples of the world. I believe that readers will be interested in learning an essential detail, namely, how the snake's head is supposed to be positioned clockwise or counterclockwise. After all, there are different variations in different cultures. 1. 2. 3. Figure 5. The symbol of the universe the snake biting its own tail. Parts of the image in bas reliefs, paintings in the temples of the ancient Egyptian culture. A finger ring in the form of a snake biting its tail, from the archaeological findings in the Indus Valley, the the Harappan. Civilization. Proto-Indian civilization that existed in the 3-2 millennium BC. Ancient Chinese symbol a snake biting its own tail, the symbol is made of nephrite, considered as stone of life in China. Rigdon, the original position of the snake's head was precisely clockwise as a symbol of creation and development. The schematic representation of the number of dimensions in the form of scales rings was, respectively, from left to right. A circle, snake's coil, was also the symbol of the creating and spiral movement of the universe, the clockwise, correct swastika, in other words, movement according to the main action of the forces of Alad, the supremacy of spirit over matter. In the ancient times, this symbol was often used in the decoration of temples as a sacred symbol that narrated the divine knowledge. The head of the snake was painted counterclockwise, as a rule by the adherence of the material mind, the animal mind, as a symbol of a small force that drives the universe inward counterclockwise, the reverse swastika, in the direction of destruction and annihilation. These people, while obeying the will of the animal mind, proclaimed for themselves the supremacy of matter over spirit and embodied into reality the principle of domination of the material power. Anastasia, in essence, this is a substitution of the sign from plus to minus. I have often seen such a snake whose head is directed counterclockwise in architectural scenes from Freemasons. Rigdon, 
this phenomenon was quite common, for example, in the Middle Ages, during the surge of alchemy, when the direction of the head of this ancient reptile was often depicted counterclockwise as a symbol of artificial containment or regression. On the other hand, such details were only known in the narrow circles of initiates. The masses were presented with a quite plausible interpretation of this concept, so the common people paid little attention to the rotation of the head in this or that direction. And that is too bad because symbols and signs play a significant role in the life of a society, even when the society does not suspect it. But some portrayed the snake's head counterclockwise knowingly, while others, because of the basic human confusion, loss of knowledge, or incorrect copying of the ancient information, based on which the given plot was sketched. For example, the same can be seen today in the symbolic representation of the world in the form of the legendary ancient Indian serpent Ananta. According to the Indian mythology, the universe is a giant global snake biting its tail and winding itself around the creation in a ring. Inside the ring, it was carrying a giant turtle, on whose back there were four elephants supporting the world. In the center of the world was the inhabited land Jambadvipa, reminiscent in form of a blossoming lotus flower with Mount Meru in the middle of it. Figure 6. The Ancient Indian Symbolic Representation of the World The traditional interpretation of the image in encyclopedias, according to the myths, 1. The legendary serpent Ananta, from Sanskrit infinite, endless, floating in the waters of the cosmic ocean, its other name is Shesha, legends mention that God Vishnu rests on its rings, 2. The triangle above the truncated pyramid represents the power of the higher over the lower. 3. Conventional representation of an image of Mount Meru, in this case in the form of a truncated pyramid. 4. Symbol of the visible physical world in the form of a hemisphere. 5. Four elephants, symbol of the elements, supporting the terrestrial world. The elephant symbolizing the element of air is not visible. 6. A turtle resting on the serpent and Antishesh's rings the embodiment of the ancient Indian guardian god Vishnu, the universal vivifying nature. The interpretation of the image from the perspective of secret knowledge, the drawing is made from the perspective of world perception of the Freemasons with the substitution of signs a reorientation for the aggressive direction of the world, the supremacy of the animal mind. The snake's head is changed the cobra with an open hood is depicted counterclockwise. There is a drawing of two dimensions in the center of the world instead of the lotus flower and a symbolic representation of Mount Meru, in the third dimension, the human one, a truncated pyramid is set with the visible six steps and the corresponding symbol of the earthly power, the vertex of a triangle with thirteen rays, the image of which is often used by Freemasons as their distinctive sign. The symbol of a snake biting its tail was quite common with different peoples in the ancient times. In myths, it was associated with the image of the universe, with the act of creation of the world or sustenance of the earth. For example, in the mythology of the African peoples, particularly in the Dahomey mythology, there is this archaic character Edo Huido the Rainbow Serpent. According to the myth, it appeared first and existed before all others. This snake has supported the earth, having curled up and bit its own tail. According to another myth about the world creation, the serpent Edo Huido accompanies the head of the pantheon of gods Maulisa as a servant. Moreover, it is mentioned that during the act of creation, this snake carries the mentioned god in its own mouth, in other words, in the jaws. Anastasia, that means that the supreme god of Dahomey produced creation of the world from the jaws of the snake. So this is a direct reference to the knowledge that God actually creates out of the 72nd dimension, more precisely, at the intersection of the 72nd and 1st dimensions. It's amazing. It turns out that the people of Dahomey also possess such knowledge. Rigdon, unfortunately, this West African nation, like many others, no longer possesses such knowledge but has only partially preserved some of the information to our times in its legends that had been passed down to their ancestors long, long time ago. Although in former times, such knowledge was given to different peoples on different continents that were geographically disconnected from each other. Anastasia, yes, 
the symbol of a snake biting its own tail can be found not only in the mythology of the ancient peoples of Africa, the Dogon people, the Egyptians, but also of Asia, the Chinese and the Sumer, of North America, Aztecs, and in the myths of the ancient cultures of other continents. Written, with time, in the human interpretation, the symbol of the serpent biting its tail acquired the meaning of all-encompassing unity, of all in one. It has become a symbol of eternity and infinity, marked the beginning and the end, alpha and omega, creation and destruction, and also self-renewal of natural cycles, cyclicity of time, of birth and death. This symbol of the universe, immortalized in the ancient Egyptian images, later appeared with Phoenicians and the Greeks who came up with a name for it, Auroboros, which in Greek means devouring, absorbing, its tail. Then this word came into common use of alchemists, and the meaning of this symbol has undergone an even greater distortion. In today's world, at the suggestion of Kabbalists, this symbol came under the interpretation of depth psychology. In this version twisted by the human mind, it is already regarded as a basic archetype that symbolizes the prehistoric unity of the masculine and the feminine, serving as the beginning of the human individuality when I is immersed in the unconscious, from which the conscious experience is not yet differentiated. In general, the farther away from the original knowledge and the greater the immersion into an abyss of material human logic, the more the truth is lost. Although this does not mean that this truth is unknown today. Take the present-day priests who have access to the ancient knowledge, they are trying to hide the truth from the masses in order to maintain their power over these masses. But originally the knowledge was given for all people. Anastasia, yes, everything is simple in this world when you possess knowledge. Concerning the mention of 72. Surprisingly, in fact, the number 72 is a combination of numbers, 12 times, cycles, by 6. Written, absolutely. This number is interesting in many ways. In the ancient Egypt, for example, there was a thorough knowledge of the geometry of space, exact numeric values for measuring angles of geometric figures. The latter formed the basis of knowledge in the implementation of various projects in construction and architecture, including the unique ones, due to which certain conditions for changing the physics of space were formed. A clear example is a set of the Great Pyramids in Giza built during the times of ancient Egypt. Although, the true purpose of such complex architectural objects, the angles of which are accurate within a degree, built with certain materials and specific complex architecture, is probably only clear to those who have knowledge about the interaction of fields, about subtle energies and the principles of operation of other dimensions, and also about the influence that signs have on the world. But this is not the point. The main thing at the moment is that this knowledge existed in ancient Egypt. Anastasia, you once spoke of the ancient Egyptian god Osiris, of his activity, speaking our language, as a bodhisattva, and about the fact that the ancient Egyptians associated number 72 with sacred religious symbols. Written, that is correct. The ideas of the ancient Egyptians about the sacred number 72 are also related to the level of perception of the Bodhisattva as a spiritual being associated directly with the world of God who knows the essence and who is able to control and use the integrity of 72 dimensions. That same Osiris was portrayed not only as a human but also as a lotus flower, initially with 72 petals. Some images of him had knowledge about the universe encrypted in them. For example, in certain stories, the white robe, in which Osiris was portrayed as the supreme judge of human souls in the afterlife, was covered with an interlacement of a certain number of nodules that were lotus buds, originally 72. Later when these stories were redrawn numerable times and copied by people who did not know about the sacred knowledge depicted there, this number changed and the apparel of Osiris was pictured like that of a mummy, in other words, in a way that was more understandable for the average person's mentality. But then again, if you possess the knowledge, then even with those texts that came down through millennia to the present generations, thanks to the temple paintings and the graves of the ancient Egyptians, it is possible to understand what they are all about, as they say, to separate the wheat from the chaff. 
Anastasia, it is no wonder that reading these texts today, their translation and interpretation causes great difficulties for professionals. After all, in order to understand what the ancient Egyptians wrote about, we must at least move away from the format of the consumer mindset, and at best have a fundamentally different worldview, a qualitatively different level of knowledge. Written, yes, otherwise there will be the same confusion as with the medieval Kabbalists. Today, it is not a secret that Jewish priests borrowed much knowledge from other peoples, including the Egyptians, having interpreted it in their own way and then having presented it as their religious teachings. So, the number 72 was associated by Kabbalists with the idea of the unutterable name of God, which can control all levels of the universe. For medieval Kabbalists, this secret name was the main subject of study. In fact, this number has nothing to do with the name of God, but the idea that this is the essence of the universe and that it contains all the forces of nature in it is true. Their mistake lay purely in human issues, namely, in the wrong translation and interpretation of the information about the ancient Egyptian knowledge and signs which were then modified by them and presented as a Kabbalistic idea, Mark, of the name of God. They believe that the one who is able to correctly pronounce this name is free to ask anything he wants of God. In fact, this is a limited understanding coming from the human mind. Such a perversion of knowledge is typical of people when they begin to interpret the spiritual knowledge from the logic of their animal nature. Anastasia, you are right. People are foolishly craving absolute power, exchanging eternity for an illusory moment. Rigdon, unfortunately, people yield to illusions imposed on them by the animal mind, not delving deeper, and ignoring their most important asset the spiritual essence. Let's consider at least the following example. The ancient Egyptian legend of Osiris and Seth was passed down to the present day. In its time, it was interpreted by the minds of the ancient Greek philosophers of the wealthy classes. It tells that Osiris taught people a new world outlook, farming, healing, building cities, mining and processing of the copper and gold ore, in general, all the attributes of civilized life. Seth the younger brother of Osiris, who was considered an evil god of the desert, was jealous of the glory and power of his brother and wished to rule in his place. Seth came up with a clever way to destroy Osiris. Executing it, he came to Osiris with his 72 accomplices. Their plan worked, and they destroyed Osiris. But thanks to the wife of Osiris, Isis, the evil was subsequently punished and justice was restored. As a result, Osiris resurrected, but this time as a judge of human souls in the afterlife. So this is what I want to say on this subject. People often think from the perspective of their human desires, losing sight of the important things. Since number 72 represented the level of knowledge of Osiris, Bodhisattva, the opponents of the spiritual world began to attribute it to themselves in order to underline the strength of their opposing force. That is why later in the structure subordinated to the Archons had formed circles, the size of which varied within the limit of 72 chosen priests and so on. But this human way of thinking is ridiculous because the quality of the force of a spiritual being is beyond all comparison, especially with regard to the quantitative number of people whose consciousness is dominated by the animal nature. In this legend, in the form in which it reached us today, the priests tried to show the masses that gods behaved in the same way as humans. By the way, this idea was especially actively disseminated through the ancient Greek legends, about the gods of Olympus, and it is no accident that they were later hyped all over the world among different peoples. Why was it done? In order to instill an idea into the masses that wars which, in fact, are conceived and organized by priests fighting among themselves for the earthly power, are normal because gods are supposedly doing the same, that evil is also supposedly natural because it is a characteristic of gods. In other words, priests convinced people that if there is a king above you who wishes power and sends people to war, this is normal because gods do the same, if there is an evil boss above you, this is also natural, and you, the plebeian, have to listen to him and obey him. As a result, 
all this forms a subservient public consciousness and leads people away from the real spiritual path. And for a generation of priests, such an ideology is a convenient excuse for their greed for wealth and desire for power. That is why today this information is subconsciously hammered into people's heads almost from childhood. It can be found in textbooks of various civilized countries. That's how spiritual knowledge is perverted and substituted with material aims and concepts in order to enslave the masses. Anastasia, people seem to be lacking the determination to shake off all the husks and live by conscience, as their soul suggests. You have mentioned that not only can people achieve spiritual liberation during their lives and reach the level of the seventh dimension, but also to know higher dimensions. Rigdon, absolutely. Everything is interconnected in the universe. Human, thanks to his unique energy structure, is connected with all 72 dimensions. However, it is one thing to be connected without even realizing these invisible connections and another to consciously know all these dimensions, moreover, in a new spiritual quality. A spiritually developed person can know all the 72 dimensions and reach the level of a bodhisattva during his lifetime. But, as I said, a person who has known the seventh dimension, ceases to be human, he becomes like a newborn unit of the spiritual world, an immortal spiritual being with an individual consciousness and a great spiritual potential. In other words, a being who is released from the circle of reincarnations and who can leave his temporary shell, the physical body located in a three-dimensional physical world, and consciously go into the spiritual world at any time. Imagine what changes will occur in him during his cognition of all the dimensions of the universe in his qualitatively new state. But again, such a rapid spiritual development is only possible during his lifetime. Unfortunately, in practice, such people were few in the history of mankind. While cognizing higher dimensions, a person, let's say, gets to know not only the artificial creation of the universe on a deeper level and a larger scale but also the idea of God, the power of the spiritual world and his communion with him. A person, evolving spiritually to the level of a bodhisattva, passes 72 hypostases in the spiritual development, 72 mirrors. Of course, this way of cognizing the world conceived by God is not easy, and for such a spiritual path, the right precise tools are needed just like in science, in other words, the knowledge of certain meditative techniques which enable gradual spiritual development. It is clear that this path is not for everyone, but still, a person who is craving the spiritual truth is able to comprehend it. The legend of Seth and Osiris warns exactly that you must not step onto this path while possessing the human logic from the animal nature and the wish for immense power and the earthly, for it will end in a punishment for such spiritually immature people. But even a great spiritual journey starts with little, with the first steps. You must practice spiritual awareness and not the understanding coming from egoism and mind filled with dreams of the fulfillment of the earthly desires. If a person wishing to develop spiritually limits himself only to such desires as I want, I'll become, I will, but in reality, does nothing, and does not change in his daily life, then no good will come of it. But if a person is really engaged in self-education and self-development, constantly refining himself with discipline, self-control, and spiritual practices, then eventually he learns how to control his emotions, his behavior, and his thoughts. It is only when a person masters an altered state of consciousness that is new to him and stabilizes in taming his animal nature that the invisible world will start revealing its secrets to him. Spiritually refining himself further and learning about the processes of the complex world of the universe from the perspective of the observer from the spiritual nature, a person unfolds like a many-petaled lotus flower enriching himself with wisdom and knowledge. When he realizes the complexity of this world, he simultaneously comprehends its simplicity in the light of the unfolding eternal truth. Evolving spiritually, Man may waver in his choice until he passes the sixth dimension in his spiritual development. In the seventh dimension, he loses all doubt as a new spiritual being, and only the truth remains and just one the spiritual vector of further development. In the ancient times in the East, 
the stages of learning the path of a bodhisattva by men were figuratively compared to a blossoming of the lotus flower when it grew out of the muddy water showing a mature pure white flower over its surface. The beginning of a person's spiritual path was compared to a lotus seed that sprouted on the bottom of a swamp or a lake, by which the three-dimensional material world was meant. Man's spiritual growth, his fight against the animal nature, the removal of doubts and the earthly desires, work on the discipline of thought, and mastering of spiritual practices was likened to the growth of the stem, its passage through the thick muddy water as it thrust its way to the surface. Merging the soul with the personality and the spiritual liberation when the seventh dimension was attained, when a new spiritual being was conceived and it became noticeable to the spiritual world, was compared to the appearance of a bud above the water surface, in other words, its manifestation in a completely different world. And most importantly, the accessibility to the bud, undis toured by the muddy waters, of the direct rays of the sun, the power of the spiritual world, under which the bud began to unfold its snow-white petals. Every new opened petal personified spiritual attainment of the next dimension by the personality. And this process went on until human learned all 72 dimensions, in other words, until all the 72 petals unfolded fully and a magnificent lotus appeared in all of its divine beauty under the shining rays of the mighty luminary who created it. So with human, who upon having reached the level of a bodhisattva, stood in all his spiritual wealth before the one who created this divine seed and gave him eternal life. Anastasia, this is a very impressive and accurate comparison. Once, during a discussion of the results of one of the spiritual practices, you had clarified one important point about why in the ancient times an opened lotus petal epitomized the embodiment of the spiritual comprehension of the next dimension. Could you tell the readers about it as well? Rigdon, of course. Even today the cognition of each new dimension by man can be compared to the process of growth and unfolding of new lotus petals which appear, grow, and gain momentum in their development even though before this their projection was only in the laying of the genetic program of development of the given flower. Same with a human who during the cognition and mastering of each new dimension manifests in his structure a new petal which, figuratively speaking, is responsible for the relationship with the given dimension. Naturally, the lotus flower is a conditional comparison, so to say, to gain an understanding of the essence of the process. But if we speak about reality, then the manifestation, development, and improvement of the variety of interrelationships, which have been built into him initially, take place in the energy structure of human during his spiritual development. Anastasia, many people simply associate their existence only with the third dimension without understanding their true potential. But when you realize even a small fraction of it, you also understand the great responsibility for your life, and to what extent everything is interconnected in it, including with regard to dimensions. Rigdon, that is true. I have already said that when a person is born into a body in this material world, the state of his consciousness is tuned to the wave of the animal nature, to the basic perception by the new personality of the information of the material three-dimensional world with physical sensory organs. The task of the person who has embarked on the path of spiritual development is not only to learn how to switch to a different state of consciousness independently, but also to explore the world in a capacity that is new to him, expanding his abilities, understanding the fundamental difference between the material and the spiritual worlds, in other words, to make his conscious choice. Indeed, everything is very closely interconnected in the world. But what does a person know about the world? Let's just say that as of today, certain fields of the third dimension have been studied to some extent, for example, the physical fields, acoustic, electromagnetic, gravitational, and so on. Note that we are speaking about the dimension with which each person has identified himself since childhood and considers it as native, familiar, and largely known. But does a person know that, in essence, these fields consist of coarse energies? In their turn, these coarse energies consist of the so-called subtle energies which, unfortunately, have not been studied by the modern science as of today. But the thing is that they, these subtle energies, are a part of the fields of the next dimension. 
This way, an interchange and interaction occur between dimensions. A simple example is a human thought. Why is it that scientists still cannot track its origin? Because its formation is connected with subtle energies of a different dimension in which man also exists, or rather, in which a part of his energy structure is located. While in our dimension, it is coarse energies that are manifested, so to say, the derivatives of this search which are the ones recorded by scientists observing the firing of neurons in the brain. In general, it should be noted that all the dimensions, space, and time are related to each other, they originate from and consist of various combinations of the very conditional building blocks of the universe, of which I spoke earlier. Anastasia, yes, today science knows little about other dimensions but already there is information that makes intelligent people start thinking. For example, it is interesting that man sees his body in this particular shape and not in another because his vision is adjusted to the perception of electromagnetic waves within a certain range of frequencies or, as physicists say, in the range of the visible light. In the infrared or the ultraviolet spectrum, in the light that is not visible to the eye, or in the girl in photography, man will look somewhat different. Rigdon, undoubtedly. In short, with modern equipment or certain meditation techniques, one can see different forms of light, man's electromagnetic field, the form of the aura, and so on. And the whole ambiguous form of a person can be seen in three-dimensional space which, in combination with time, makes up four-dimensional space. But in five-dimensional space, from the perspective of the interaction of subtle energies, a human appears already differently in the shape of a pyramid with a detached top. In the sixth dimension, there is a small enhancement of the pyramid. It is important to note that the power of the animal mind is limited only to six dimensions which make up the material world of the universe. Roughly speaking, the material world comprises only 5% of the universe. From the seventh to the seventy-second dimension, there is a world of energies and information that also forms the material worlds of the universe as well as perfect energy structures, thanks to the movement and power of Alad. And beyond the universe, there is the world that is qualitatively different from it the spiritual world, the world of God which, as a matter of fact, a person can get into as a new spiritual being. At that, it is sufficient for him to reach the seventh dimension, escaping from the material captivity, in order to cross over to the spiritual world afterwards at will. But let's get back to the material world. A human being is capable of, even with the dominance of the animal nature in him, experiencing, interacting on the energy level, and consciously influencing matter up to the sixth dimension. Usually, a person seeks to develop such supernatural abilities in himself for the sake of gaining power over his own kind in the three-dimensional world. This is the main desire that makes a person successful at it if the animal nature dominates. Although this dominant desire remains virtually unnoticed by the consciousness of the person who is in the state of submission to the will of the animal mind. At best, the person is trying to justify it even to himself with noble reasons, supposedly showing care for other people and helping them. Anastasia, in other words, these supernatural abilities can be present not only in the people following the spiritual path and maintaining the dominance of the spiritual nature in themselves but also in those who are going in the opposite direction and live under the rule of the will of the animal nature. Written, that's right. They can be, for example, psychics, magicians, sorcerers, people with paranormal abilities, in other words, those who are capable of submerging down to the sixth dimension in an altered state of consciousness and from there, influencing the lower dimensions and weak structures, to manifest energy activity and make certain transformations. Influencing the third dimension from the perspective of higher dimensions, the fourth, the fifth, and the sixth, naturally, affects the coarse matter of the three-dimensional world at the level of information. However, while exerting such influence, the person himself is not fully aware of why he is given this power and what he is really doing, what changes he is really making, and whom he actually serves. Such energy influence, even from the sixth dimension, but from the perspective of dominance of the animal nature in man, does not indicate spiritual development.